Twenty-five years ago, an aeroplane carrying Rwandan President Juvenal Habyarimana was shot down on approach to Kigali International Airport. For a country that had spent years on the verge of tearing itself apart, the death of the president was the match in the powder barrel. Fear and hatred, stemming from decades of ethnic divide instituted by early 20th century colonialism, and further stoked by inept leadership, crippling famine and eventual economic collapse, culminated in a deadly climax on April 6, 1994. With the peace accords broken, hardline Colonel Theonesta Bagasora seized control of the nation, mobilizing armies and paramilitary militias, ostensibly to oppose the Tutsi-backed Rwandan Patriotic Front that had resumed its attack from the Rwanda-Ugandan border. However, the plan to eradicate Tutsis from Rwanda had been carefully choreographed by high-ranking political and military leaders for at least two years prior. Under Bagasora's orders, the mass slaughter of Tutsis and moderate Hutus began within hours of the president's assassination, their names taken from lists drawn up months before, identifying them as enemies of the state. State-sponsored xenophobic propaganda, broadcasted by radio across the country, called upon the Hutu majority to rise up, to turn on their Tutsi neighbors, and purge the enemy from the land once and for all. In just three months, at least 500,000 Tutsis were brutally massacred all across Rwanda. It was the deadliest genocide the world had seen in 15 years. Everybody knew every day, live, what was happening in this country. You could follow that every day on TV, radio, Who moved? Nope, nobody. Yeah. Though most of the outside world turned a blind eye to the horrors in Rwanda, not everyone left behind was as willing to bear silent witness to the massacres. The crippled UN peacekeeping force, which by the end of April consisted of less than 300 mostly unarmed soldiers, managed to shelter and protect several thousand Tutsi civilians at various safe havens established throughout the country. The most famous of these UN safe zones, the luxury Hotel de Mircolin, run by hotel manager Paul Rosessa Begina, would later become the subject of the critically acclaimed motion picture Hotel Rwanda. When people refer to you as a hero, how does that sound to you? Well, to me it doesn't sound right. Because me, I'm not a hero. Shall we conclude that whoever does his job as he's supposed to do it is a hero? In humanity's darkest moments, there are always those who emerge as shining beacons of light, and the Rwandan genocide proved to be no exception. And among the heroes who risked life and limb to save lives, was a brave captain from the tiny African country of Senegal, Captain Mbai Diang. Mbai Diang was born on March 18, 1958, to a family of nine children living near Dakar, and he was the first in his family to attend university. Following his graduation, he enlisted in the Senegalese army in 1983, where he eventually achieved the rank of captain. Ten years later, he would be one of the 39 soldiers Senegal would provide for UNAMIR, the United Nations peacekeeping mission sent to Rwanda to oversee the enforcement of the Arusha Accords. Signed on August 4, 1993, the Arusha Accords was a peace treaty between the Tutsi-led Rwandan Patriotic Front, or RPF, and the official Hutu government of Rwanda. It sought to end the civil war that had racked the nation for three long years. The Accords stripped many powers from then Rwandan President, Juvenal Habyarimana, and envisioned a transitional government in which power would be shared among the majority Hutu and the minority Tutsi ethnic groups, following which general elections would be held to ensure a democratically elected president. In October 1993, the United Nations Assistance Mission in Rwanda, or UNAMIR, was established by the UN to oversee the successful implementation of the ceasefire agreement. Ultimately, I, I, I felt we could do it. 
But that is a, a bravado, I think, also from my part. Nothing was going to stop me. Bit of innocence in there, eh? However, commander of Unimir Romeo Dallaire soon realised that the peace accords had done little to abate the simmering ethnic hostilities. Rwanda in 1993 was a nation in crisis. Though the early years of Juvenal Habyarimana's presidency had been relatively free of disharmony, the 1990 invasion of the Tutsi-dominated RPF had reignited decades-old racial tensions between the Hutu and Tutsi. Fearing imminent loss of power and control, Many prominent members of the Hutu government, including the president himself, had deliberately fanned the flames of age-old hostilities. Hutu leadership began pushing hateful rhetoric against the minority Tutsi population in Rwanda, reviling them as outsiders and invaders aligned with the rebels and insurgents. By the end of 1990, the ethnocentric Hutu power movement was swiftly gaining traction, a racist and supremacist ideology that idealized the Hutu as a naturally superior race, while simultaneously demonizing Tutsis as bloodthirsty oppressors bent on restoring a Tutsi monarchy in Rwanda. Racist propaganda preyed upon fear and resentment, calling for increasingly violent retaliation against the Tutsi enemy, while at the same time denouncing any sympathetic Hutu as traitors and rebels themselves. Radicalized youth groups and militias like the Interahamwe were founded by the Hutu-dominated government, and given extensive training to combat the threat that the Tutsi, despised as cockroaches, posed to Rwanda. Even as military stalemate in 1993 forced the warring sides to sign the peace accords, the racial hostilities in Rwanda had reached a breaking point. <laughs> As the end of 1993 drew near, it became apparent that the situation in Rwanda was even more dire than it had first appeared. The Hutu power movement was in full swing, and President Habyarimana was rapidly losing support from the more radical members of government, who wanted to see more aggressive action taken against the RPF. In January 1994, a government informant contacted Romeo Dallaire with a warning that he had been ordered to register the names and addresses of Tutsi residing in Kigali, and that Hutu extremists had been importing weapons and arming militias en masse. The informant suspected that there were plans for a mass extermination of Tutsi across the country, and he gave Dallaire the locations of four arms caches in the city. Dallaire immediately took action, forwarding the information to UN headquarters in New York, and announcing his intention to raid the arms caches. The response from New York was swift and unyielding. Unimir had no authority to conduct a weapon seizure, and Dallaire was rebuked for attempting to exceed the limitations of his mandate. The message was clear, the United Nations would observe and facilitate negotiations in Rwanda, but beyond that there was to be no use of force, not even in the interest of saving lives. With no ability to enforce the terms of the treaty, and with Hutu hardliners in power obstructing every attempt to install the transitional government that had been agreed upon, the fragile peace in Rwanda was rapidly crumbling. By March, the situation had deteriorated to the extent that riots and assassinations had become a daily occurrence. It became simply a nightmare for the Tutsis, for all of the members of the opposition parties, even if they were Hutu and we lived through a series of political assassinations almost on a daily basis. Every day, every day God gave us, we had three, four, five dead bodies, people that we picked up on the streets every day. To quote Major Brent Beardsley, Dallaire's executive assistant in Rwanda, it was like watching a fuse burn into a powder keg, and then in March and April, you could just sense it was deteriorating. And finally, there was an explosion. Heavy fighting has broken out around the capital of Rwanda hours after the president died in a plane crash. The plane was shot down by a rocket near the Kigali airport. That means that the government has collapsed. It's not at all clear who's in charge of Rwanda at the moment. On the evening of April 6th, 1994, 
plane carrying President Habyarimana, as well as the President of Burundi, Cyprian and Teriyamira, was shot down by two surface-to-air missiles as it was approaching to land at Kigali International Airport. To this day, nobody knows for certain who was responsible for the attack. Hutu extremists were quick to assign blame to the RPF, whose intent, they claimed, was to resume the war and continue their violent pursuit of power. Many historians today argue that the killing was quite possibly carried out by Hutu extremists themselves. Their motivation would be twofold, to depose a leader who was too moderate for their liking, while simultaneously orchestrating a terrorist attack that would serve as the impetus for the genocide they had spent months preparing for. Whoever was behind the murder, its effect was both instantaneous and catastrophic. Colonel Theonesta Bagasora, the Chief of Staff of Rwanda's Defence Ministry, rallied the Hutu radicals in Parliament and quickly seized control of the country. Within hours of the President's death, Bagasora's government was already sending out death squads to execute the Tutsis and moderate Hutus they had gathered intelligence on in the previous months. Legally, Prime Minister Agathe Ulinji Yamana was next in the line of political succession. However, Hutu hardliners regarded her moderate views with contempt, derogating her as weak and refusing to recognize her authority. Attempts to protect her and her family as the Unamir scrambled to restore peace proved futile. By 10 a.m., only 14 hours after the plane crash, the presidential guard stormed the UN volunteer compound where Agath was taking refuge murdering her and her husband. To date, Madame Agath remains the first and only female Prime Minister of Rwanda. The death of Agath Yuwilinji Yamana cemented power in the hands of the Hutu hardliners, who continued their systematic elimination of each one of their political enemies. To quote journalist and author Linda Melvin, it was later ascertained that everyone, whether Hutu or Tutsi, who wanted power sharing, or who had spoken out against Habyarimana and Hutu power were listed. Every journalist, every lawyer, every professor, every teacher, every civil servant, every priest, every doctor, every clerk, every student, every civil rights activist were hunted down and killed in a house-to-house -house operation. General Dallaire, we've been hearing all kinds of reports that all hell is breaking loose. What has been going on? If you uh, stated that all hell is breaking loose in Kigali, uh, that would be a reasonably fair uh, statement. Hours after her assassination, UN soldiers arrived at the compound where Madame Agath and her husband had been killed to pick up the aid workers who were still stationed there. It was here that they discovered the Prime Minister's five young children, unarmed and hiding in the bungalow. A fierce argument broke out about what to do with the children. The soldiers had not been given any authority to transport them, and with the Presidential Guard on the lookout for the Prime Minister's children, travelling anywhere was extremely dangerous. A set of armoured cars had been expected to arrive to escort the aid workers to safety, but they never appeared. Finally. One of the unarmed UN soldiers decided that he personally would drive the children to safety. He loaded them in an unarmored car, covered them with a tarp, and navigated the various roadblocks that the Hutu killers had already set up throughout the capital, bringing them to the relative safety of the UN guarded Hotel de Mirkulin. Il y avait euh, justement euh, après on avait on a appris que c'est euh, un capitaine qui s'appelle le capitaine Bay qui faisait partie des casques bleus donc euh, c'était lui qui avait organisé euh, notre euh, notre euh, fuite jusqu'à l'hôtel. The Marie Christie and her brothers eventually escaped Rwanda to safety. Many others were not so lucky. The Hutu genocidaires understood the political sphere that the United Nations was operating in. They knew that the international community was restless, frustrated by the lack of progress in Rwanda. In the wake of Mogadishu, a disastrous battle in the Somalian civil war that had claimed the lives of 18 American soldiers just several months prior, the Hutu knew that if the lives of the UN peacekeepers in Rwanda were threatened, 
the United Nations would be all too keen to abandon the mission and leave Rwanda to her fate. Indeed, the same informant who had previously alerted Dallaire of the arms caches and the impending genocide had also warned him that an attack had been planned on the Belgian peacekeepers in Rwanda. Belgium had committed the largest and most well-equipped contingent of soldiers to Unimir, and the Hutus correctly predicted that if Belgium could be coerced into withdrawing their troops, other nations would quickly follow suit. Thus, in addition to killing Madame Agath, that same day the Presidential Guard also captured the ten Belgian soldiers who had been sent to protect her. Forced to surrender their weapons to the Hutu army, who vastly outnumbered and outgunned them, the Belgians were taken to a Rwandan military base, where, for the next three hours, they were tortured, beaten, and killed. The international community responded to the murders just as the genocidaires had predicted. Despite Dallaire's pleas that what he needed was more troops, more arms, more resources, and most of all, more freedom to combat the deadly waves of mass slaughter that were sweeping across Rwanda. Over the next few weeks, the United Nations voted to withdraw more than 2,000 of the troops that had been commissioned to Unimir, leaving only 270 behind. Foreign governments also sprang into action, organizing mass evacuations of their expatriates in Rwanda. On April 9th, two days after the death of the Belgians, over a thousand French, Belgian and Italian soldiers landed in Kigali. They were heavily armed, well-fed, and well-equipped, in stark contrast to the exhausted, hungry, ragtag peacekeeping force that Dallaire had been assigned. Had the soldiers been able to bolster the forces of Unimir, together they could have made a powerful fighting force to quell the violence and bloodshed. Already, there is mounting evidence of a genocide specifically targeting Tutsis. Reports of a pile of corpses six feet high outside a main hospital make front-page news, and the death toll is estimated to be at tens of thousands. But the European powers were only interested in saving their own, to the extent that in many cases, the evacuation of white Europeans and Americans didn't even include the spouses and families of expats who had married into the country. Many desperate Tutsi tried to board the trucks escorting the civilians to safety, only to be forced off at the checkpoints and roadblocks where they were killed right in front of the European convoys, who were under orders not to intervene. Dallaire later recounted, Mass slaughter was happening, and suddenly there in Kigali we had the forces we needed to contain it, and maybe even to stop it. Yet they picked up their people, and turned and walked away. They didn't know much of what was happening. They didn't care what was happening. Africans weren't going to kill Africans. What was it their business? And not one of them, not one single one of them, was offered to Dallaire to help in saving the Tutsi. They could have stopped the damn thing within two or three days, and not one single country soldiers did it. With the international community apathetic to the plight of the Rwandans, and the Unimir ultimately reduced to less than 300 soldiers, anarchy and mass murder swept across the country. The Rwandan army was soon joined by the Interahamwe and other radical youth wings and militias who carried out the killings using mostly crude weapons such as machetes, knives and blunt objects. Hundreds of thousands of Tutsis were hunted down and slaughtered in their homes and on the streets. Many thousands tried to take shelter in churches and school buildings, only to perish when the buildings were set ablaze and destroyed by the genocidaires. Others were killed trying to escape the country, caught and identified by the Interahamwe guarding the vast network of checkpoints dispersed throughout the cities. Still more were tracked down from the transmissions of the radio television Libre de Mucolim, a Rwandan radio station whose broadcasts range from hateful propaganda inciting violence against the cockroaches infesting the land, to explicitly providing the names, locations and even license plate numbers of fleeing Tutsi. Those Hutu who refused to take part in the killings, or who tried to protect their Tutsi fellows, were also butchered by the Interahamwe. It is estimated that altogether, some 200,000 Hutus participated in the genocide and about 800,000 Tutsis were massacred. 
I spoke to the Red Cross representative and I asked him how many people had been killed. And the, Philippe said something along the lines of, in the first few weeks, I said that 100,000 people had been killed. A few weeks later, I said loud and clear that I think half a million people have been killed. And now you're another journalist and you're asking me again. And I'm telling you, I can't count anymore. Half a million people have been killed and I've stopped counting. Vastly undermanned, under-resourced, and strictly forbidden against any use of force, Delaire's peacekeeping force could play little more than a bystander role in the ensuing bloodshed. Still, the Unimir did the best they could with what they had. Several safe havens were set up around Kigali, in hospitals, churches, and schools, each one housing several hundred Tutsi refugees, and each one guarded by a small handful of UN soldiers most of them unarmed. Quite amazingly, these people who were very brave managed here and at the ICRC hospital to prevent armed people from coming in saying, stop, you're not allowed in here. This, is, this site is protected by the UN. And, he, and you ask yourself, well, here's one guy with no gun, sitting on a wooden chair all day and you're, you know, all night, you know, not sleeping. And he's able, with no gun, to convince people that they're not allowed in here to kill people. I mean, there were some powerful, brave things that were being done by UN soldiers, completely devoid of any support from New York. Forget it, I'm sorry, nothing came from those people. Throughout it all, there was one soldier who had been explicitly defying orders not to intervene since the beginning of the crisis, Mbai Diam. What sort of guy was he? What sort of personality was he? Tall, svelte, smooth, but uh, energetic. A, a, a sparkle in his eye. Mbai Diang was one of eight unarmed UN peacekeepers stationed at the Hotel Demi Colin, one of the few sanctuaries for Tutsi refugees in Kigali. The hotel sheltered over a thousand Tutsis throughout the course of the genocide. But it soon became apparent that Mbaye was doing more than just guarding the Rwandans taking shelter in the hotel. To quote Gregory Alex, the head of the UN humanitarian assistance team in Rwanda, we'd see in this back room of a hotel or headquarters, they had large groups of people that all of a sudden appeared and the next day were gone. We began to put together that Mbaye was bringing people from all over town to the headquarters and evacuating them, or having them picked up and taken to safety elsewhere. Armed with nothing but his wit and his courage, Mbaye single-handedly conducted possibly hundreds of secret rescue missions throughout Rwanda. Every day he would ferry Tutsis to safety, four or five at a time in his UN car, bargaining his way through dozens of checkpoints with jokes and small bribes of cash cigarettes or alcohol. Babaka Fai, one of Mbaye's former comrades, recounted, Mbaye liked to tease people, that was his nature. Sometimes, at the roadblocks, he'd joke with the militiamen and their chiefs. But he was also generous and he liked sharing things. In his car, he would often have cases of beer, bottles of whiskey, lots of packs of cigarettes, and lots of money. À chaque fois qu'il passait un barrage, les gosses lui disaient Bon, chef, on a faim, on a soif, on a. Il donnait soit sa cigarette, soit quelquefois le chef lui donnait une bière ou un whisky, ça dépend. But he was a, he was a Muslim. Vai was a Muslim. Oui, mais... he, he carried alcohol around in his car to give exact. out to the militia yes. to make friends with them. Exactement. Pour rester ami, et ça, lui, ça le sauvait aussi. Et ça lui permettait d'aller partout sans être suspect. In an interview with one of the killers who manned the government roadblocks, Emmanuel Harindantwali recalls how Mbaye would charm his way through the military checkpoint, despite clearly transporting Tutsis in his car. Akavugana nabo yari umuntu ubonuzi kuganira nabantu 
sakabaganiriza neza aseka bona na kibazo akabigisha yamara kubigisha ukabona barabura kari buracururitse bafungwe barriere aragiye How much Mbaye's superiors suspected or knew about his secret rescue missions is unclear. At the time, it was the sort of knowledge that was best left uninvestigated. I knew what Mbaye Dian was doing. I had a very, very strong uh, suspicion, put it that way, of what he was doing. And had I investigated, I could have found out, but I didn't want to find out. I didn't want to say there is a Senegalese officer saving people in this town. You can imagine what the impact of that would have been. He would have been killed. Since the genocide, the BBC managed to reach out to several Tutsi survivors whose lives were spared thanks to Mbaye Dian. One of them, Konsili Mukamwezi, recounted how Mbaye intervened when she was held at gunpoint by a Hutu priest who was accusing her of collaborating with the RPF. Astonishing as it may seem, it was not the first nor the only time a clergyman would partake in the genocide. Cet abbé, il avait une, une, une Karachinkov, comme Christian. montré comme avec le Captain Mbai never sought nor received any reward for his actions. His tireless search and rescue missions continuously put him in harm's way, yet his conviction never faltered. Odette Niramilimo, a Rwandan doctor who survived the genocide, recalled a time that Mbaye placed himself between her and a group of armed militiamen threatening to kill her. Despite at one point having a gun pushed up against his own neck, Mbaye stood firm until the Hutu finally retreated. He seemed shocked, Dr. Nira Milimor later recounted. He was saying, They almost killed you, you know. They really wanted to do it. What really struck me was that he seemed far more worried about us than he had been about himself. Despite his cool and confident demeanour, Captain Mbaye was not unaware of the danger he was constantly facing. Less than two weeks before he was scheduled to return home, Mbaye called his wife and voiced his fears to her of not surviving his final days in Rwanda. In the phone call, he spoke frequently of his own mortality, saying, Death can come at any moment, but you can only die once. On May 31st, 1994, only three days after the phone call, Mbaye's luck ran out. He had been tasked with delivering an important handwritten message from the head of the government army, Augustin Bizumungu, to his commander Romeo Dallaire. At the final checkpoint between the RPF zone and the Hutu government's last stand in Kigali, Mbaye was stopped and waiting to pass when a mortar round exploded on the road a short distance behind his car. Who fired the mortar shell is not known, but the impact was lethal. Shrapnel tore through the car and hit Mbaye through the back of his head, killing him instantly. First pictures of the death of a United Nations officer described by colleagues as the bravest man in his outfit. Captain Mbaye Diagne, a liaison officer, died on the front line of this divided city, killed by shrapnel from a shell that landed close to his car. They're calling around for a body bag, and there's no body bags. There's not a body bag. There's nothing left, and there's nothing. And you wonder, you know, 
you know, at this time we're starting to put it together and we're saying, you know, here's a, here's a guy who gave his ultimate, who did everything, and we don't even have a body bag, you know. But I think to, you know, show him some respect. A makeshift body bag was fashioned for Captain Mbai using light blue UNICEF tarp and some tape. The Unimir headquarters held a minute of silence and a small parade in his honour. But outside of Rwanda, there was little acknowledgement of his passing. In later correspondence between the BBC's Mark Doyle and Romeo Dallaire, the former asked pointedly, Can you imagine the blanket media coverage that a dead British or American peacekeeper of Mbaye's bravery and stature would have received? He got almost none. It is not known exactly how many lives were saved as a result of Mbaye's defiance. At least a hundred, perhaps a thousand. In July 1994, five weeks after Mbaye's death, the Rwandan Patriotic Front captured Kigali, overthrowing the government and ultimately bringing an end to both the civil war and the genocide. Fearing retribution over their role in the murders, many of the Hutu killers fled west to Zaire. In Rwanda, Paul Kagame, the leader of the RPF, took control of the country and began a series of mass arrests detaining and bringing to trial the perpetrators of the genocide. With the legal institutions in tatters, and many lawyers and judges having either fled or been murdered in the mass killings, justice and restoration proceeded slowly. Between 1996 and the year 2000, 3,343 suspects out of a total of 130,000 detained in prison had been tried by the courts. Of those cases, 32% were sentenced to life in prison, and 20% received the death sentence. In 1994, the United Nations established the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which eventually convicted 61 individuals of crimes against humanity. Colonel Theonesta Bagasora, the political and military leader of Rwanda throughout the genocide, was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2008. In the years since the genocide, Rwanda has made slow but steady progress on its journey towards recovery. Under Paul Kagame's leadership, the country worked to restore law and order, and to rebuild the structures and institutions that had been destroyed through war and bloodshed. And though ethnic tensions are slow to dissolve, the RPF government has made efforts to abolish racial supremacism in Rwanda, enacting policies to downplay the distinctions between the ethnic groups of Hutu and Tutsi. In the aftermath of 1994, the UN peacekeeping mission was ultimately regarded as a devastating failure due to the inane mandates passed down from New York and the reluctance of the UN Security Council to expend money, resources and manpower to quell the violence. Delay returned to Canada a broken man, and so too would many of the soldiers in his unit battle with depression and post-traumatic stress. Some would inevitably take their lives unable to cope with the death and destruction they'd seen, the slaughter of 800,000 people in one of the most tragically preventable genocides in the modern world. Yet, though it may seem but a small consolation, there are thousands of Rwandans who would not be alive today were it not for the bravery and sacrifice of those 270 peacekeepers who risked their lives to protect those that they could with what little they had. Sadly for Captain Mbai Diang, he never lived to see the impact of his heroism and courage. C'est une forme, je dirais, d'injustice dans la distribution. Mais bon, ça fait partie de... Disons que cette mort l'honore. Elle est conforme à ce qu'il a fait. Je lui dois la vie, hein, mes frères également. Je pense que s'il avait été là, est-ce que je serais là euh, Je ne sais pas. 
Mais en tout cas, moi, je, je tenais à, à vous rencontrer. J'ai accepté de faire... Euh, de vous parler parce que c'était un peu aussi pour lui rendre hommage. C'est une sorte de reconnaissance. Malheureusement, il n'est plus là pour que je puisse lui dire directement. Mais c'était euh, pour honorer sa mémoire.